So I want to talk about two different things. Uh, the first topic I'm going to talk about are new theories of what happened before the Big Bang. Um, and this is an issue which I've been interested in for a while. I'm not a cosmologist, but through my science writing, I've been always uh, quite interested in cosmology. And then I'm going to use that as a stepping off point uh, in the second part to talk about this book that I've written, or at least some of the ideas in it, uh, The Constant Fire Beyond the Science versus Religion Debate. So I hope you'll excuse me. I've never given a talk on the uh, cosmolo this part of the cosmology before. This is based on an article I did for Discover Magazine uh, in, um, I think it was April of last year. And it's probably going to be the topic of my next book. So um, we'll see. As you can tell, already the first typo, uh, science mythology and the, the science versus religion debate. <laughs> Way to go. Yeah, proofreading. It's a great idea. OK, so I want to start off with this idea. Uh, this is my favorite quote by the poet Muriel Ruckheiser. The universe is not made out of atoms. It is made out of stories. And I think that's a really beautiful quote and says a lot about um, what I want to bring to you today, which is this idea of how science and its narratives, the stories that science brings, um, in many ways recapture something very ancient for us. And this is uh, mythology. And that in many ways, science serves as um, a mythological system for our modern culture, speaking to the deepest issues we can take on, and also um, creating meaning for us, setting our own lives in context. Science is not usually seen in this way, but I think this is really the direction that we have to go for a number of reasons. So what I'm talking to you about today is part of, a part of it is what I did with my sabbatical. I had a sabbatical a few years ago, and I wrote a book. And the book I wrote, uh, the goal was to find new perspectives on the relationship between science and spiritual endeavor. Notice I'm not using the word religion there, because religion connotates a whole lot of different things for people. It can be about power and about real estate and you know, a whole bunch of other things. What I'm really interested in is the, you know, the personal experience people have that leads them to <coughs> either be religious or spiritual or whatever they want to call it. Okay? So that's one of the important differences for me. Now, why did I do this? Is because I'm really interested in the context of science, right? We live in a society that is saturated with both the fruits and poisons of science. Um, you know, climate change is if you want, you need go no further than that. Um, and the traditional science versus religion debate, which is all about, you know, evolution versus someone's interpretation of someone's scripture, just does not exhaust or even get to really the depth and the richness of the possible relationships between science as a social practice and a means to finding some truth and what goes on in spiritual endeavor. So I'm just, I'm so tired of people yelling and screaming about evolution versus uh, uh, creationism that there's got to be more to, to be said about this topic. Um, so I'm interested in mythology, I'm interested in the long history, going back 50,000 years, of human beings' encounter with the world and their attempts to make sense of it. Um, and then uh, along with that is a word I'm going to introduce you to today, uh, herephony, a herephony, which is a place where the sacred manifests itself, where the sacred erupts into the world or erupts into our lives. Okay, so a little table of contents. Always good to have a table of contents, know where you're going. So first, very short prologue on science and myth. And then I'm going to tell you about the Big Bang, which is our dominant scientific model for the creation of the universe. And then I'm going to show you that the Big Bang is in trouble right now, that we're kind of ending, we're at the end, in some sense, of the traditional Big Bang model for the universe. And then I'm going to tell you about ideas that are beginning to percolate around about alternatives, and particularly, in particular, ideas where you don't have a Big Bang, right? Where you don't have time suddenly starting, OK? Uh, and then. I will, um, uh, th and the second part after we take our break, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions that you guys will have about the end of the beginning, that section. A lot of questions I have. Um, so, and, so we'll take our break, answer some questions, and then we'll go back to the science, myth, and religion part. Um, again, if you want more on this, there's an article I did. You can get it on the web uh, from Discover Magazine, the April 2008 issue. The title of it was, um, the day before Genesis. And it was about both the Big Bang and these radical alternatives to the Big Bang. OK, so first of all, a little prologue to get us set. Um, mythologies, many people, when they hear the word myth, they think, oh, false story, right? Urban myths of some old lady putting their, you know, her, her dog in a, in a microwave to dry it off. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about. Mythologies are complete systems of, um, of uh, narratives that set human life into context, 
All right, so it's not just stories about gods, you know, doing whatever. Um, they're really much deeper and much richer than that. They were stories which would set um, the transitions in life that people went through in context, marriage, coming of age, um, old age. And in that context, it was also set in some sort of cosmic context as well. And so these myths were, you know, all embracing. And they gave human beings a sense of where they were against the broad background of um, cosmic history. So answering fundamental questions was always the prerogative of myth slash religion. All modern religions emerge from our mythic heritage. And in many ways, you know, modern religions still carry that mythic heritage with them. So the big questions, um, things like our origins, humans' relationship with the natural world, the existence of some absolute uh, enduring reality, and the eventual fate of all things, these were all places that human beings went to myth. They went to their mythological narratives. So these were sacred narratives. You didn't just hear, like, one of the things about mythologies is, like, it wasn't like the shaman would come along and say, hey, kid, you want to know how the universe began? You know, you only, these stories were only told at special times during the year in ritual, and they were meant to evoke a sense of the world's sacred character. We'll talk later on what I mean by sacred, but the world's sense of being more than just the day-to-day. -day. Um, so it's very important to understand that, that it's not, you know, mythologies, these narratives, weren't just lying around. They were told at special times and in special ways to bring the experience of the world as being different than the day-to-day -day, uh, in, in people's, uh, into their experience. Now, in our modern and postmodern culture, these sacred narratives, I'm going to argue, have been replaced by scientific narratives, right? The origin of the universe, the origin of life, the origin of the human species, these are all the narratives of science. They have their individual research specialties, but overall, those specialty, those individual small stories about carbon dating or about you know, planet formation fit into a larger story, which is itself you know, hearkening back to our deepest mythological uh, roots. Okay? That's what I'm trying to show you, that science serves this explicit function. And I'm very aware of this because I write for the, the public. And I've become aware, as my, when my editors would say, wow, this story sucks, you know, <laughs> that I wasn't telling a story. I was just giving a bunch of facts. And until I learned that I had to present the story as a narrative and call back to people's sense of drama and, and um, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, um, connectedness, uh, that people wouldn't really respond to the story I was telling. <laughs> Okay, so I just showed you this is a picture of Pangu, the Chinese creator god, and here is a picture of the cosmic microwave background, which is the echoes of the Big Bang, which I'm about to talk about. So, you know, sort of just images showing that difference between mytholo classic mythology and now um, the way science functions as myth. Okay, now this lecture, the next, you know, 20 minutes, I'm going to be talking really about the problem of time. Right? which is fundamental to human existence, because we're born, we live, and we die. Um, and uh, the origin of time is always something that, you know, in every mythology, plays a central role. Now, for scientists and philosophers, this has been an enormous question. It's only been recently that we have some scientific way of addressing it. And the questions about time that cosmology touches on is, you know, did, like in the Big Bang, time just started, like, you know, God firing up his Porsche. I mean, where, how does that happen, that there's nothing and then there's the Big Bang? What came before the Big Bang? Um, does time repeat itself? Is it some kind of cycle? If the Big Bang's wrong, do you have some kind of you know, cyclical universe repeating itself? Why does time have a direction? You know, why are we aware of the fact that we're moving towards the future from the past? Right? We can't go, you can't unscramble an egg. Okay? That's a fundamental question in science that has to do with cosmology. Or is time an illusion? Is, do we think that we're moving through time, but that's just some uh, accident of psychology? All of these alternatives have been explored in mythology. The world's heritage of mythology has pretty much exhausted all the possible answers to this. And what you will see in scientific theorizing after they take the data is often a recapturing of some of those mythic themes. So there's a writer, a cosmologist, Marcelo Gleiser, who's written a bunch of really beautiful books talking about how the, you know, these various um, options for thinking about the universe have already been explored in mythologies. OK, so let's get to the Big Bang. So Big Bang, the Big Bang is a cosmological model. And the, what's interesting about cosmology is up until, you know, 100 years ago, it was purely the domain of philosophy. There was no data. There was nothing you could do about it other than, you know, sort of sitting around over a beer and thinking about, you know, how the universe began. But now, in the last, particularly in the last 20 or 30 years, it has become a precision science. And that is really extraordinary. And in that precision, 
we have actually gotten to the edge, in some sense, of the Big Bang. So let's just first talk about the Big Bang to begin with. Right, so what's the idea of the Big Bang? Well, this is, first of all, our standard cosmological model. It has had enormous success um, as a way of explaining the data about the universe as a whole. Um, and the idea is that the universe began as a single compressed geometric point which, quote, unquote, exploded, okay? <laughs> now, the thing to that you have to remind yourself is it didn't explode into anything. It was all space, all time, all matter, all dimension. And what you had expl exploding was space itself, time itself, dimension itself. There was no, it wasn't like there was a shoebox of empty space that the Big Bang went off in. The, sh the Big Bang was the shoebox, okay? So there's no inside or outside. There is only the universe, only existence. Now this explosion was tremendously hot and tremendously dense, and as the universe expanded, you know, like a balloon expanding, it cooled. And as it cooled, you went through a variety of physics transitions, which eventually leads to um, all the structure we see in the universe today. So the universe started out hot and dense and smooth and grew into galaxies and clusters of galaxies and clusters of clusters of galaxies and, you know, lumpy things like planets and people. Okay. So, and much of what the cosmology, what the Big Bang theory is about is articulating from the first point to the, to the third, or really from the third point, the explosion was tremendously hot and dense to how we got all the structure. And it's been incredibly successful in that way. So here's just a, you know, a representation of it. Um, you have the Big Bang happening here. The size of this cone delimits the size of the universe. So you see the universe started out very small. There was this period of rapid inflation called, a rapid expansion called inflation which I will talk about. And then the universe just continued to expand. Uh, and as time went on, you got, you know, guests, first stars forming, and then galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And here we are today, 13.7 billion years after the moment of creation. Okay? So that's a pictorial representation, which is wrong in the sense that, again, this sort of, you, it sort of makes it look like there's some outside. There is no outside. Okay? This is just an, a convenient way of representing it. So how do we know this Big Bang is true, right? I mean, if it's a scientific idea, it's got to have evidence in support of it. And, uh, you know, thinking that you know anything about the universe at all is an extraordinary claim, so you better have some extraordinary proof to back it up. And there are three pillars on which classic Big Bang theory rests. The first is the expansion of the universe. We can see every galaxy expanding away from every other galaxy. Right? That's for sure. And if you think about it and you run the movie backwards, if everything's expanding away from everything else, you run it backwards and everything you would think would be compressed if, you know, at some point, hot and dense and compressed. The other thing is the uh, abundance of primordial elements, things like hydrogen, helium, boron. You can make very explicit predictions that what came out of the Big Bang in terms of those elements, and it matches very beautifully. And then finally, and most importantly, there is what is called the cosmic microwave background radiation, which are fossil photons, fossil light waves, left over from the Big Bang. And let me talk about that for a second, because it's very important. So this cosmic microwave background uh, was first predicted in the 1940s and 50s before anybody believed in a Big Bang. Um, and Ralph Alpher and his associates calculated uh, sort of asked themselves what would happen if the universe was dense and compressed. And what they figured out was um, this hot, dense universe should have emitted this very special kind of radiation called black body radiation. It is light that is connected with any kind of matter's temperature. So right now, all of you guys as solids with all of your atoms packed together are emitting black body radiation. Um, what you're most familiar with it, of black body radiation though is a red hot poker, right? If you take an iron rod and stick it in a fire and you leave it there long enough, it'll begin to glow red. That is basically heat radiation, okay? So that red glow is coming about because the iron rod has been, um, uh, its temperature has been raised to the point where it's emitting and in, uh, most of its light where your eye can pick it up. On the other hand, right now, all of us, whoops, excuse me, all of us are emitting radiation. If you had an infrared camera, this room would look like this, full of, because all of us right now are emitting radiation, it's just that the radiation, our eyes can't pick it up, it's in the infrared part of the spectrum. So if you take an early universe, you take a universe that's hot and dense and compressed, it will act like this. It will produce its own heat radiation. And that is what is called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And it was discovered um, back in the 1960s, and what they, um, found was, so let me show you this, 
This is a map, imagine, but this is a map of the entire sky. So basically you take every part of the sky and you map it onto that oval, okay? And this is a map of this radiation coming from the Big Bang. And you'll notice, other than that little band in the middle, it's smooth, which is what you'd expect. If the, if the universe was a hot, uh, um, dense, uh, you know, mush of material, and it was all emitting radiation, then anywhere I look in the sky, I'm looking back in time to the Big Bang. So everywhere I look, I should see the exact same radiation. And so that's what I'm seeing there. This, that smooth green is basically the, the, that is the Big Bang, or at least not quite the Big Bang. It's about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. So that smoothness tells us that, yeah, I'm seeing all the way back to when the universe was essentially smooth and homogeneous and hot. This little band here is actually just the effect of the galaxy, of the Milky Way, the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. But now that wasn't enough for people, because people knew that, you know, right now the universe is all lumpy. So there must have been the seeds of those lumps even back then. The universe must have had these tiny, tiny ripples in it um, that eventually gravity got hold of and turned into galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So later on, around the 1990s, people sent up a satellite to start looking for those little ripples and this is what they found. So these ripples are actually tiny uh, perturbations in the density of the cosmic microwave background. So this, this little lump here is slightly hotter than the background. This little lump over here is slightly cooler than that background. And these are the things which as time went on, gravity got hold of and started to pull inward. Anything that was a little bit denser than its environment, gravity started to suck together and that's what built the first galaxies. 